Hello, thank you so much for tuning into my YouTube channel. Today's video is going to be a simple tutorial on writing a very simple neuron network to be used in a binary classification problem. I'm going to be covering the basics of this problem and I'm going to be also showing you guys what variables and why you should use in your neural network so that you would have the best output. Let's get started and see how we could do that. As I said, this video is going to be a simple tutorial on binary classification using neural networks. We'll be working with IMDB dataset instead of 50,000 highly polarized reviews from the Internet Movie Database. They're split into 25,000 reviews for training and 25,000 reviews for testing, each set consisting of 50% negative and 50% positive reviews. The IMDB dataset comes packaged with Keras. It has already been pre-processed. The reviews sequences of words have been turned into sequences of integers where each integer stands for a specific word in a dictionary. Okay, uh, the following code will load the data set. From Keras data sets import IMDB. Very simple. This is where we separate the training and the test data sets. Train data, train label. And the same but with the test. Test data and test label. IMDB load data. Number of words words would be 1,000 would be 10,000 sorry now let's see if it loads the data so we're good let's go to the next one so first I have to explain that the argument num words uh, 10,000 here means you only keep the top 10,000 most frequently occurring words in the training data. Rare words will be discarded. This allows you to work with vector data of manageable size. The variables train data and test data are list of reviews. Each review is a list of word indices which encodes a sequence of words. Train labels and test labels are a list of zeros and ones, where zero stands for negative and one stands for positive. Because you're limiting yourself to the top 10,000 most frequent words, no word index will exceed 10,000. Now let's prepare the data. You can't feed list of integers into a neural network. You have to turn your list into tensors. Okay, so now you have to turn your list into tensors. One hot encodes your list to turn them into vectors of zeros and ones. This would mean, for instance, turning the sequence 3 to 5 into a 10,000 dimensional vector that would be all zeros except for indices 3 and 5, which would be ones. Then you could use as the first layer in your network a dense layer capable of handling floating point vector data. You should also vectorize your label, which is very straightforward. So that's how it's done for labels and for the data. Now the data is ready to be fed into a neural network. The input data is vectors and the labels are scalars, ones and zeros. This is the easiest setup you'll ever encounter. A type of network that performs well on such a problem is a simple stack of fully connected layers with ReLU activations. 
You can intuitively understand the dimensionality of your representation space as how much freedom you're allowing the network to have when learning internal representations. Having more hidden units, a higher dimensional representation space, allows your network to learn more complex representation, but it makes the network more computationally expensive and also may lead to learning unwanted patterns, patterns that will improve performance on the training data, but not on the test data. There are two key architecture decisions to be made about a stack of dense layers. One, how many layers to use. Two, how many hidden units to choose for each layer. Here we use two intermediate layers with 16 hidden units each and a third layer that will output the scalar prediction regarding the sentiment of the current review. The intermediate layers will use ReLU as their activation function and the final layer will use sigmoid activation so as to output a probability, a score between 0 and 1, indicating how likely the sample is to have a target 1 or how likely the review is to be positive. A ReLU, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit, is a function meant to zero out negative values whereas a sigmoid squashes arbitrary values into the 0 and 1 interval, outputting something that can be interpreted as a probability. So this shows what the network looks like. Okay, let's code up the network. From caress import models and from caress import layers and then model would be model sequential and then model so here's the model finally you need to choose a last function and an optimizer because you're facing a binary classification problem and the output of your network is a probability, it's best to use the binary cross entropy loss. It isn't the only viable choice. You could also use, for instance, mean squared error, but cross entropy is usually the best choice when you're dealing with models that output probabilities. Cross entropy is a quantity from the field of information theory that measures the distance between probability distributions, or in this case, between the ground truth distribution and your predictions. Here's the step where you configure the model with RMS prop optimizer and the binary cross entropy loss function. Okay, we say model compile say model compile here it is in order to monitor during training the accuracy of the model on data it has never seen before, you create a validation set by setting apart 10,000 samples from the original training data. Here it is. Let's now train the model for 20 epochs, 20 iterations over all samples in the X train and Y train tensors. At the same time, we'll monitor loss and accuracy on the 10,000 samples that we set apart. We do so by passing the validation data as the validation data argument. Okay, note that the call model fit returns a history object. This object has a member history, which is a dictionary containing data about everything that happened during training. This dictionary contains four entries, one per metric that was being monitored during training and during validation. In the following two listings, let's use matplotlib to plot the training and validation loss side by side, as well as the training and validation accuracy. Okay, here is where we show the loss and here where we show accuracy. Let's run them. Okay, okay it's going through the training, as you can see. Okay, this is over. As you can see, the training loss reduces with every epoch. But the training accuracy increases on the other hand. That's what you would expect when running gradient descent optimization. The quantity you're trying to minimize should be less with every iteration. 
but that's not the case for the validation loss and accuracy. They seem to peak at the fourth epoch. This is an example of a model that performs better on the training data and isn't necessarily a model that will do better on data that it has never seen before. In precise terms, what you're seeing is overfitting. After the second epoch, you are over-optimizing on the training data and you end up learning representations that are specific to the training data and don't generalize to data outside of the training set. In this case, to prevent overfitting, you could stop training after three or four epochs. After having trained a network, you'll want to use it in a practical setting. You can generate the likelihood of reviews being positive by using the predict method, as you can see here. As you can see, the network is confident for some samples like 0.99 or more or 0.00 or less, but less confident for others like 0.6 or 0.4 as you can see here, point six. Anyway, that's about it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it and you were able to learn something useful. If you liked it, I would appreciate it if you could subscribe to my channel and also share the video with your friends. Thank you so much and have a nice day.